Hey guys, welcome, welcome back to the show. It's Nikayla here with another episode of Side Hustle Pro. And today we are back with a special episode. We have Morgan DeBond in the guest chair. This is not Morgan's first time here at Side Hustle Pro. And so today we have an update episode and I'll link to her original episode in the show notes. So Morgan, if you don't know, is a serial entrepreneur and corporate advisor. She is the founder and CEO of Blavity Inc., which is a leading digital media company for Black culture and millennials. Morgan has grown the company into a market leader for Black media, reaching over 100 million readers per month through a growing brand portfolio, which includes Blavity News, 2190, Afrotech, Travel Noir, Shadow and Act, and Lunch Table. Under Morgan's leadership, Blavity has launched several consumer summits, including Summit 21 for Black Women Creators and Afrotech, the largest tech conference for Black innovators and founders, which I'm sure some of you have been to. Morgan also acts as an advisor to influential global brands and companies, including Disney, American Airlines, CES, Pantora Bridal, and Rosen Skincare. She is also an angel investor in Gold, a consumer brand present in over 200 stores and public, which has a $1 billion valuation. Now, this is clearly incredible, and you'll see why I wanted to have Morgan in the guest chair. But what I really also love about Morgan is that she is a serial entrepreneur and a unabashed, unashamed multi-hyphenate, which she talks about in this episode. She talks about the fact that she has defied the expectations of what a CEO is, what a CEO should be, and has gone after what sets her soul on fire, which is learning about new industries, which is learning how to create and found new businesses. So we talk about that in today's episode. I think you'll really enjoy it. And you'll even hear her give me some timely business advice and wisdom. So I hope you enjoy it. And before before we get into the episode, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. Now, the other day, I was talking to a Side Hustle Pro guest. We were wrapping up the episode, and she mentioned again just how difficult and stressful HR was for her as she's ramping up her new business. So I was like, girl, have you heard about Gusto? Are you using that? And she said she hadn't heard about it. And I was like, you have got to look into Gusto. And you guys too, let me tell you, If you have turned your side hustle into an official business, then you are probably starting to see that small business owners, we wear a lot of hats and not all of these hats are fun. Let me tell you, let me keep it real with you. Not all of these hats are fun. Things like filing taxes and running payroll, they can be really daunting. But that is where Gusto comes in. Gusto makes payroll, taxes, and HR actually easy for small businesses like ours. You have fast, simple payroll processing, benefits, and expert HR support all in one place. And Gusto automatically pays and files your federal, state, and local taxes so you don't have to worry about it. Plus, they make it easy to add on health benefits and even 401ks for your team. Those old school clunky payroll providers that you're probably used to, they were not built for the way modern businesses like ours are run, but Gusto is. So let Gusto wear one of the many hats in your business. Side Hustle Pro listeners, you can get three months free when you run your first payroll. Just try a demo. Head over to Gusto.com slash SHP. That's Gusto.com slash SHP for your free demo. Enjoy. Welcome to the guest chair, Morgan. So good to have you back. It has been, you were one of my like early, early guests back in 2016. I'm sure we both don't remember what was said. (laughs) So everybody could go back and listen to that. I'll link it in the show notes. So why don't you give us kind of an update on what you're working on these days? How are you juggling and prioritizing each of your businesses and just be the unique CEO that you are? Yeah, so things are going well. Um, thank you for having me back. Um, yeah, this was one of my, I feel like, maybe first or second podcast interviews I've like oh, ever done in my entire life was on your wow. podcast. So I am like kind of horrified to go back and listen. <laughs> 
me too. Because it's like listening to me before I really practiced interviewing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so let's see. I mean, for those who may be listening who aren't familiar, you know, Blavity Inc. is the company that I'm the CEO of and founder of. Um, Blavity Inc. owns a variety of other brands and properties. So you can kind of think of us like a large media holding company. So we have a centralized, incredible team of sales and finance and HR and creative. Um, and then we have our each one of our brands. So Afrotech. 2190, which has Summit 21, Travel Noir, which is a brand I acquired from an incredible founder named Zim, um, and Shadow and Act, as well as Blavity, of course, our flagship. So it's been an incredible seven years. Wow. Has it been that long? Oh my. It's been seven years. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And in addition to that, you've also, you know, as Morgan Debon also started other businesses while you have been CEO and how do you work that into your entire vision for your life and for your different companies? You know, I have always been a multi hyphenate. Like I've never, even like growing up, I was like, I love soccer, I love taekwondo, and I love art. I don't want to pick. I love chess, and I want to do that really well. And so I've always done a lot and really embraced every single part of my interest. And one of the incredible things about Blavity that I'm so grateful for is the experience of growing as an individual and growing as a leader with a group of people at, at, while we're all working together towards a mission of improving the lives of Black people, improving the lives of all of us in terms of the content that we're creating, putting money back into the Black creator economy through the, the people that we work with, through the influencers that we hire, working with big corporations to make sure that they can advertise in a way that feels authentic to us that's like right. actually built by black creators and so i've enjoyed going on this journey with a group of people and building this company and at the same time as i was scaling the business and really transitioning from founder to a ceo to a chairperson to an executive um I started to miss some of those early days of founding things of like just being able to post things on Instagram and, you know, not having to go through my own approval process. With <laughs> I remember distinctly the day, like I used to run Blavity's Instagram account. And I remember Sabine, who's one of our probably like first five employees, maybe even earlier than that. And she was in control of marketing at the time. And I remember going on Instagram and posting something and not asking her, I just been like, I'm busting it. And then she, her like talking to me about it and being like, hi, so I know that you're <laughs> posting, but like we have a schedule, we have a calendar, mm -hmm. like the co the captions, the tags. So, you know, if you want something, just send it to me and I'll, I'll get it in there. But like, please don't just go into the account and post. And I was like, wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's they built though, and, and you, and yeah, you it. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now, I mean, that, that was incredible. And we were only like five or six people at the time, but you know, now we have seventy-five employees. So you know, I can't even read the amount of content that we post every single day from all of our brands. I'm I'm reading the newsletter just like the rest of y'all. Like, oh shit, that's a good story, girl. <laughs> you know, but, so it's um, it's it's really refreshing. But as my like being part of my right. identity as an entrepreneur. And so I started to build other businesses, one of which was myself as a brand, as a person. I am now a multi six figure business as a brand. And then other things that I've tested and built and, and investing in other businesses. So as an angel investor, um, so yeah, I've had an incredible journey and I really am excited about having the capacity in the space and creating my own space where I can be who I truly am as an entrepreneur and a CEO. And one of the things I remember you touching on, I think in recently in your, your Instagram stories, but even before that was how you feel like you kind of have to defy what the expectations of a CEO are. And I can totally see how it would be a lot of pressure to just want to live your life, but then also always having to have that like second guessing yourself of, oh, but what will people think? <laughs> so walk us through how you navigate that and where you've come to, where you've landed with that. Mm. 
Yeah, you know, I am a, I was a young CEO. I was 24 when I started the company and we were very successful very quickly. Um, I also had a lot of press, whether I asked for the press or not. I didn't hire a PR firm until like six months ago, you know, so <laughs> there was a lot of attention on the story and the narrative. Some of that was intentional, but other than that, like, there was a sense of my name and our brand preceded us oftentimes. And so there was a lot of perception, a lot of conversation without people having interacted with any of our brands, having attended any of our events or having met me. And it's a privilege. A lot of that is because we've been successful and so many people haven't been able to kind of crack the nut of venture funding. And we are a predominantly black team, a female founder. And so we were defying the odds along the way just by existing and I just wasn't prepared for that level of pressure. I didn't necessarily set out to be this like brand. It was build a company, build a product and serve the black community. But oftentimes in our community, when you're successful, you become a brand, you become a hero, you become a role model for people. And um, it hasn't always been easy to balance. And even there's even times when I remember I was traveling so much that I would like doing speaking engagements, meeting with clients, fundraising, I would come back to the office, but the business was growing really fast. I was come back to the office and be gone for like two weeks or three weeks or something like that. And there would be people in the office I didn't know because they had had their start date and I had, I didn't interview them. They weren't on the team that reports into me directly and I didn't know them. And so they had this whole perception of, Oh my God, Morgan and Bond are CEO. Like, oh, she just oh God, God. I don't know who are you? You know, and, and you want to get to know everybody by story yeah. and name and your company. And that's something that's also very important to me. But I was running a hundred miles a minute. Uh, you know, and so there, there was definitely a transition. I would say year like three through five is a bit of a blur because we were, we were doing a lot very quickly. Mm. I can see how also as you are building out the brand now, like now that you realize that, okay, it's happening organically. So now let me take some time to shape it into what I want it to be and who I want the brand to be, that there's also that pressure as well. I heard you say, and I think it might have been you know, on another podcast or something, but I heard you say that you actually had a rough 2019 and, you know, as you were ramping up for 2020, I'm sure you were (laughs) breathing a breath of fresh air, like, all right, 2020 will be better. And then boom. (laughs) But you guys pivoted really quickly. Like you had that whole virtual experience with Afrotech and that was amazing. How did you go about like getting into that space of pivoting while also holding on to being able to salvage brand partnerships and relationships to make sure that your team was okay. Yeah, it's such a big question. And I learned um, so much in those six months of early COVID days, like I'd say March through like August. I grew exponentially and I'd say everybody around us at the company grew exponentially because we had no other choice. Mm -hmm. And we were so committed to one another as a team to ensure that we could save as many people's salaries as possible, make sure that people had benefits. We didn't know what was going to happen, right? Like many other companies, there there was a large cloud of, we don't know what the future is. You know, we think we're gonna shut down for two weeks. It could be two months, it could be a year, it could be, we don't know. And um, I felt a deep sense of responsibility to protect our legacy yeah. so that we didn't run out of money. We didn't not have our brands right. and to protect our team mentally as we made went through this process. And we had to make some tough decisions. We had to make some tough decisions on furloughs and layoffs. I took a huge salary cut. Everybody who was full time, I asked them to take a salary cut so we didn't have to Um, lay off as many people so we could kind of pass the burden through the full entity. And, you know, I think that the Blavity team, because of how we're made up, because we're a group of majority people of color or women or people in the LGBT community, we're very freaking resilient. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, this ain't the, this is about the worst thing that we've been through in our lives. Right. And Um, I think that resiliency is something that got us through it all, but it wasn't necessarily without its battle scars. You know, a lot of people were burned out towards the end. Um, You know, some people even resigned because they're like, honestly, I don't want to be a media at all. Like, I don't want to cover this stuff at all, you know, and... I don't have the luxury of being a, being like, okay, I need a break. I'm burned out. Bye guys. (laughs) Right? Like as the CEO and the founder, 
And my co-founders, like, we don't have the luxury of just being able to take time off, especially in times when we're really needed. And so I had to figure out a balance and take care of myself while still making sure that I was, as the leader of the, the company, fully present and able to make the tough choices um, and help us be decisive during a, a time of crisis. And how did you do that? Because... Obviously, we don't want you burning out. We, we, we need you not only strong, but also healthy and feeling at peace as, in as much as you can. So how do you juggle that in terms of getting yourself the pockets of time off that you need? Well, last year, what I did was physically change my environment. I've, I've really been focusing on the last two years, um, this idea of tiny moments of joy and tiny moments of happiness. So instead of having these large things that you look forward to, what are those moments every single day that you can look forward to, whether that's a warm cup of coffee in the morning and a, and a 20 minute you know, just sitting outside or a walk of the day is one of the things that I started to do for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, Or it's like the routine of just brushing your teeth and doing your skincare routine at night. So I just try to reframe my mindset and know that like, okay, I can't plan. We're going to go to Prague, you know, in the fall. Like I can't plan these big moments. And I'm, most of them were also centered around me because I was also isolated as as someone quarantining uh, alone at home because I could not afford to get sick. I could not afford to be taken out the game. Mm -hmm. And so I worked on on my personal happiness and feeling satisfied in the everyday happiness of my routine. And that's actually one of the reasons I moved to Nashville. We're recording this and I'm I'm at my home in Nashville and I moved during the pandemic because my parents live here. And when I look at my week or I look at my day, there is a bit of a tiny joy of like, your mom being able to stop by. You know, yesterday I was leaving the house. I was running late. I was on my way to therapy and this car pulls up and it's my dad. And I'm like, <laughs> how long do you want? I'm, I'm, I'm late, you know? And he's like, oh, I just came to give you a hug. Uh-huh. I'm like, that's yes. priceless. You know, it made me so happy. And that could have never happened if I was in LA and I didn't want to continue to live my life you know, separated from my family, just being a part of my routine as like existing. So I really encourage people who feel overwhelmed and don't feel like they're in control of a lot to figure out how you can have those tiny moments of joy in your routine and optimize your daily, optimize your weekly. Don't try to do too much. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) Very important. Like, don't come, don't just don't do it. Oh, I love that you said that. Now, I saw you move to Nashville, but I didn't know that's where your parents... Is that where you're from? Get out. No, I'm from oh, St. Louis. Oh, right. That's what I thought. I'm like, you went to Wash U and you grew up in St. Louis. Okay. And they moved to Nashville and you were like, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I lived in St. Louis my whole life. I went to college in St. Louis. Yeah. Um, I'm like ride or die 314. It's so yeah. funny. People are like, yeah. where are you from? Are you from Cali? I'm like, no. I am <laughs> Not disrespect me. Yeah, uh, but, but I, I totally relate, yes. and I think a lot of people will to you saying that you can have the most. Because I think I saw that you'd move by the beach, right? You can have everything you think you want, the best environment in another city. But what this year really taught us was like that human connection trumps it all. So. Speaking of that, how are you shifting the business now in terms of remote work? Are you guys planning to, you know, now everyone work from where you want or having like moments of times where people will be back in the office? Such a good question. Um, We're fully committed to the work remotely life because our employees are free spirits. And to me, they they proved that they could work remotely and be productive in Mm -hmm. one of the most ridiculous times in our lives. Mm -hmm. And work really well together. The good thing is we were already very digital and we already had the tools in place. We already religiously used Salesforce. We already used Slack. My co-founders and I, Jeff and and Aaron, we are started in the tech world. So we were very quick to adopt as many tools as possible to be automated and so we could scale quickly. Mm -hmm. And so that time and effort that we spent in 2018 and 2019 to build those systems and operations really paid off last year. We were able to quickly transition to remote. We're now doing smaller gatherings, dinners, lunches. I was just in Atlanta for a team lunch and a happy hour. 
the team in L- LA is doing a hike this weekend at Runyon. <laughs> nice. And, yeah, right. So like everybody's kind of gathering on their own pace, depending on the COVID kind of protocols in yeah. that state or that city. And then because we do an events business, we'll be flying certain sets of employees to Afrotech executive in LA or Afrotech music in Austin, Texas. So okay. I'm going to stay connected with people and our executives will probably travel quite a bit. And then, um, most of our employees wind up being in kind of hubs of your your typical black cities, right? Got New it, York, got it. Right, right, right. <laughs> Especially now that we can choose a little bit more where we want to be. I think that's so yeah, smart. Of international people, and I think mm-hmm. I think the team will start to move or like relocate for six months internationally. But I also think that's incredible. That will give us more diverse set of content as well. I love that perspective. And I think you're forward thinking with that and really so smart to do that because at the end of the day, employee happiness, employee morale, it's huge, especially with everything people have just gone through, but then still finding time, still finding ways for people to have that human connection. So, because you want to feel like, you know, your coworker, you want to feel like you have a home base at work. Guys, I hope that showing you behind the scenes of my funnel and even talking to other entrepreneurs about their marketing funnels have helped you to see that one of the first things you need to figure out when you're starting your side hustle is how are you going to communicate with your audience? With algorithms on social media being the way that they are, you cannot rely on social alone. So that's why you're going to need an email marketing platform that allows you to be in control. And that's exactly what you get with our awesome sponsor, AWeber. So AWeber has all the tools that you need to stay connected with your audience. You can share your messages about your products or your services and make money. So with AWeber, you get the email marketing solutions that you need to grow your business. You can choose from a huge library of pre-built email templates. So you don't have to have any experience or design background to create beautiful emails. And then you can just use the easy drag and drop editor to create your custom emails and you can even connect your brand's Facebook page and an email design will automatically populate. AWeber also has a landing page builder. You've heard me talk about the importance of landing pages, how I'm tweaking mine. So with their landing page builder, you have access to unlimited landing page templates and a pre-stock image library so you can create your custom landing page in minutes without paying thousands of dollars to a graphic designer. Plus, using the landing page builder, you also have the ability to collect payments, which I've told you guys about with those tripwires. You can set up a landing page and start selling your products or services online directly through AWeber. It only takes a few minutes to get set up and start making money. Oh, and you definitely need to use AWeber's web push notifications. It allows you to send messages to your visitors even when they're not currently on your website. Very clutch. And all of these features are included in an account, no a la carte pricing. In fact, they even have a free plan. And you know that Side Hustle Pro listeners, you have a very special offer. You can try AWeber's pro plan right now. No risk, no credit card. Just visit aweber.com and enter code HUSTLEPRO for a free 30-day trial of AWeber's pro plan. All right, don't forget that code. That's aweber.com and use code HUSTLEPRO to try the pro plan free for 30 days. This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. The online learning community is offering Side Hustle Pro listeners a free trial of premium membership. Now, many of you already know that one of my biggest side hustle hacks is Skillshare. I've been using Skillshare for years now. You've heard me talk about it. And that's because it's the truth. There are so many excellent classes on Skillshare on topics such as freelance and entrepreneurship, marketing, video, websites, basically everything you need for your side hustle and more. So my most recent class on Skillshare is this class called YouTube Success, Script, Shoot and Edit with MKBHD. And I found it helpful because it guided me through every stage of creating engaging content and then went into techniques for how to grow my YouTube channel. And it was taught by a YouTuber with over 13 million downloads. So I think he knows what he's talking about. (laughs) 
So Skillshare is where I go when I want to explore new skills, when I want to brush up on my old skills, when I want to develop new techniques, I go to Skillshare. And Skillshare has classes for every skill level. So you can take short lessons, you can squeeze it into your day. It's very easy. Plus, they also have a hands-on project to make sure that you practice and reinforce what you learn. So you've heard me rave about it. Now it's time to explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash hustle. Sidehouse Pro listeners, you will get one month free trial of premium membership at Skillshare.com slash hustle. Again, one more time, that is one month of premium membership at Skillshare.com slash hustle. So now let's get back into, you know, let's talk a little bit more about Morgan as the CEO and how do you decide when it's time to explore a new business venture? Oh, such a good question. Okay, well, where I am now is 80% of my time is still Blavity. Mm -hmm. And I would say of that 80%, I'd call it about 40% is day-to-day operations, which used to be like 90% of that 80% was day-to-day operations. Um, But now it's about 40% day-to-day operations and 40% of that 80% is like executive chairwoman, CEO, strategy, strategic relationships, investor management, future planning, um, financing, things of that nature, recruiting at a high level. Like we just hired our COO, Mm -hmm. which is our first, you know, non-founder C-level executive. He's like a real adult who is (laughs) an incredible executive from Viacom CBS, who was in charge of their merger. So that's how I spend a lot of my time now. That other 20% is 10% allocated to, I call it, well, really the other 20% is Devon Co., which is my other company, which is my other holding company that includes my personal brand. So any speaking engagement, brand deals that I'm working on, licensing deals that I'm working on, and then my investing. So uh, real estate, the WorkSmart podcast, Mm -hmm. which also Mm -hmm. folds into the small business and angel investing that I do. Okay. And why was it important to you to build out that separate holding company and to start things like the Work Smarts, where you're investing in and you're teaching and mentoring other business owners? Yeah, the Work Smart program is something that brings me, it's another set of tiny joy. So every two weeks, I get to meet with an incredible group of entrepreneurs and learn about their businesses and help them scale and hopefully avoid some of the mistakes that I made along the way. Um, it became important to me because I felt this deep sense of responsibility and gratitude for being successful yeah. and having navigated so many of the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. I mean, at any given year, we could have been taken out by any given thing, you know, and I am grateful that I, that didn't happen to me. And I know that a lot of it had to do with it, my access to information, my network and my ability to navigate and make decisions quickly. And my hope is that through my work with the Work Smart Advisor program, whether that's someone just listening to my podcast, which is free, or they're actually in my program where I'm coaching and advising them for six months or three months, wow. that they're actually able to move faster than I did and Mm -hmm. get to the next stage faster. And then from an entity point of view, just as a wealth person, as an entrepreneur and someone who really cares about building generational wealth for myself, my family, my future family, Mm -hmm. um, it was important to me to have a full entity that was another set of income that wasn't dependent on Blavity success because... You know, I think that wealth diversification is important for everyone. Having multiple streams of income is important for everyone. And having a full entity has allowed me to be able to hire full-time employees, to offer benefits for Devon & Co., to be able to scale my other business without it fully being dependent on me yet again, right? And so it's been a huge blessing that's been able to pay a lot of dividends. It was really hard work Mm -hmm. three or four years ago when I started Devon & Co. because I was really running two startups at once and I didn't have time to invest in Devon & Co. at all. So it was really just me doing my best, negotiating my little deals, my little speaking. (laughs) And uh, I'm so happy, you know, now now that I have a team to help me. And you mentioned mistakes. You said the word. Um, I'm curious if you can share like one of your biggest mistakes in this process of starting the companies that you've started from getting, you know, venture capital investment. What do you wish you knew then that you know now? 
Oh, wow. We could have a whole <laughs> on mistakes I made. Um, they're all things that I've learned from. So they're all part of my story. And, you know, like I said, they're battle scars that have made me yeah. stronger. Um, I think one of the early, early mistakes that I, that I made was just listening too much to other people's pathways and point of view on success. Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, when you're raising money and you kind of grow up in the Silicon Valley, San Francisco world, I started the business when I was in San Francisco out of my apartment in San Francisco, uh, traditional tech background was working nights and weekends to start to on Blavity while I still had my full-time job. And there was this narrative and this pathway that, that is portrayed in the tech media or in tech circles around like, you have a really great idea, you can then go raise money, you kind of pound the pavement meet with as many VCs as possible, um, and then raise money. Even if you don't have the numbers, keep raising, raise until the market won't um, not let you raise, spend the money so you can grow, like be willing to even buy revenue, buy traction because you can spend money and then you can raise against the traction that you have. There's this kind of fast growth narrative and it works for some companies that works for Snapchat, that works for some types of companies. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish that I had known earlier that we were not going to be that type of company and we did not need to be that type of company. And I could be successful without following that structure and roadmap. I didn't know anything about Silicon Valley, okay? Like, I didn't even know, I couldn't even like throw a dart on Silicon Valley <laughs> when I was four years old, you know what I'm saying? So I learned a lot along the way and I was, a, a, I'm, I'm an avid reader. I read tons of books. Like I've learned everything that I know, but if I had accepted and had the capacity to know what I know now about the media industry hmm. and about this type of business, I probably would have done things a little bit different in the middle of, of, of everything. After I raised my first couple of rounds, I think I hired a lot of people a little bit too fast. Hmm. I think that we didn't wait for people who we had hired to just like let them roll with it. You know, we would, we would just kept going because we didn't see the results we wanted. And, and I think for most people listening to this, this isn't really relevant because you yeah. all are mostly building small businesses. You yeah. have one employee, two employees. So for context, you know, we have 75 employees, right? And we had 75 employees early, mm -hmm. right? So, so yeah, I think hiring people between that 25 to 50 range was like, whoa, we didn't do that right. <laughs> <laughs> I, and there will be people who, like, and I'm sure there's people y'all know, who be yeah. like, nah, I worked at Blavity. They, they were, mm -mm, they did not have their shit together. They were right. Okay. They were right. For that little nine month window that they were at the company, yeah. it was a fucking mess. And yeah. they were right. You know, yeah. we got it together. We're right. fine now. But, um, no, I, I definitely think there was a moment there. And I think for any person who's listening right. who is hesitant about hiring, I don't want this advice to then reaffirm your brain saying, mm -hmm. no, don't make that hire. No. If you're a small business owner, hiring two people, four people, five people, that will immediately dramatically change your capacity. That's yes. different than going from 70 people to 75. Those extra five people won't necessarily make that much of an impact on the mm -hmm. business. Okay. I'm glad that you shared that. And, and we're transparent. Like, look, like it's hard to have the pressure of being a black business. We all know this, right? Like you don't always get the grace of like, yo, I'm trying to figure this out. I'm young. I don't know how to do this either. I've never done this before. I'm trying to do this. And I also need to be HR. And I also need to, you know, like yes. make every employee feel valued and this and that. It's a lot. It's a lot, you guys. So please understand that. But then you also mentioned you wish you knew that you didn't need to be that type of company, right? Like there's a there's a narrative like high growth, do this, do that. Um, so what type of company and where do you think Blavity thrives? Well, so I, we're very high growth. So we've doubled, you know, revenue minus COVID like significantly uh -huh. year over year. Like okay. we um, we hit all of our KPIs pretty quickly. We're profitable. We're cash flow positive. Like we're very good business take silicon valley and start up out of it just if you look at our business it's like yeah we're good you know but the reason why we're good is because i stopped trying to be a silicon valley business i started mm -hmm. to, to worry and prioritize the business fundamentals of profit of cash flow management of hiring finance team and frankly it was because we had made some mistakes along the way that 
we didn't want to make those same mistakes again. And my COO, Aaron, um, who's now our chief strategy officer, but my co-founder, Aaron, that's his strength is like making sure that we did set up Salesforce, that we did invest in a finance team, that we did have financial controls. So the business that I think we should have done was definitely raise money, but there was a time in which I was going to ra- keep raising money. I haven't raised since 2018 mm-hmm. and I stopped and I'm glad that I stopped because there's other media companies, Mike, BuzzFeed, Group9, Goop. Um, there's so many media companies that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars. Ozzy, Axios, Vox, hundreds of millions of dollars. I've only raised 12.8, which I know in the black community is like, oh my God. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm here for it. But that is like less than 10% of what my white boy peers are doing. Yeah. And I didn't want to go that route. So I'm glad I didn't. Okay. I'm glad that you you shared that. Now, you also have the unique experience of being a founder who has a digital business, you know, online, and then also a physical products business. <laughs> what would you say are the differences in, in running each? What have you learned? So many things. So I have a skincare line called Emrose Essentials that I started 2018. Um, and I started that business because I wanted to learn about the product business. I wanted, as a serial entrepreneur, it was important to me that I learned other industries and how to get people to transact on real items, not just yeah. like internet ads, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and Wow, I have so much respect for my friends who have product businesses. Um, I remember texting my leak and being like, sis, oh my God, why don't you tell me that warehouses are nightmares, you know? And so that business I don't think is for me and how I set it up. Like, I don't have the time to, um, like, sit in my kitchen and, like, ship labels, like, and because of profit margins and different costs, you kind of need to start that way when you're growing your product business. You need to start with a low cost, which means you're doing a lot more of human labor. I don't have the time to do that. So I picked the wrong business mm. from a profit margin point of view. So even if we make a lot of money, my profit margins are bad because I'm not at the scale that I need to be to uh, get those economies of scale and get a higher profit margin. Mm. So I've still spent some time with Inroads, but it's mostly on automation right now until I actually have the time to build up my product business. Conversely, The Growth Notebook, which is a notebook that I designed that just kind of models my own notebook that I use to take my notes, is great because it's uh, it's just two products. So the other thing mistake I made with Emerald Essentials was I had a suite of products because skincare. So I was like, here's your collection, here's your types of skincare, you know, the whole thing. Um, But the Growth Notebook is just a two product. So I would recommend anybody you know who's starting a product business to actually. Just do a hero product, do a bundle, start something small, really market it, get your value proposition right, and then focus on the supply chain and the operations. I hired an incredible woman, Alia, who runs a company called The Product Place. You can check her out on Instagram. And so she was really helpful at helping me do the supply chain to source the right uh, materials, paper, and everything and make sure that it was organized. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And thank you. I will link to that, you guys, so that, you know, you guys can take advantage and learn more about that. That's awesome. That's so good to know that, hey, you know, product is hard, but here's a better way that you can think about it. So Hero Product and with hiring the person that you just mentioned, does that take away some of the nightmare of warehouse and like the margins are less because it's like one product, you know what it's going to be and you can adjust like costs and and not cost yeah. but like how much you charge and all of that yeah it definitely takes some of the concern on the fluctuations of unexpected costs out of it, it and it's great for me because it's not my primary source of income for demon and co it's more of like passive income so we've priced it right so that it every month or every week it's just profit but it's not going to be like i'm not going to retire off of the growth <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah I think it's good for people who are side hustlers to have that that product line, keep your day job, but then have something that's giving you this passive income that you can set it up, forget it. You know, we have a social media manager that can pre-schedule all this content out. Um, and I use it all the time. I tag it in my Instagram posts and stuff. Whenever I tag it, we sell a bunch. So I, I do like the kind of batch working of products where I can go on a hole for six months, build a product, 
get it into the warehouse, do product testing, et cetera, find a distribution partner, build the website, do the assets, and then someone else can run the day-to-day of the marketing, but the product's already sitting there. Mm. I do like that about product businesses. Now, and I was just about to ask you about the promotion and the marketing side of it, because we all are multi-passionate. We have different ideas. We want to be multi-hyphenates like you. However, (laughs) how do you structure your time and your brain to, okay, I'm going to promote this thing that we're doing. We're going to you know, promote this upcoming conference today, but I'm also going to promote my beauty line, but I'm also needed to tag my notebook. And then I also want to show off merch for work smart. How, how do you make sure do you, you're a systematic person? So I know you have a system, Morgan. <laughs> What I've learned is that I should only build products that naturally fit into my day-to-day workflow. Mm -hmm. So showing my notebook is really easy because I'm actually legitimately using it every day and I'm showing you all my behind the scenes of my work day. So it's easy to show, here's my notebook, right? Right. It's the same reason why a lot of brands reach out to me for like meal kits or like uh, tech tools. Like I've done deals with Salesforce or Intel and it's because they know I'm actually going to use it, right? Like I will show you Salesforce because I use Salesforce every day at Blavity, right? I'm going to talk about um, laptops because I'm on a laptop and y'all see it on the phone and people are like, you use a PC? And I'm like, I do use a PC, like for real, for real. Like my actual computer is a PC, my laptop is a PC because for all these reasons. So I recommend that people build products that they can naturally, authentically Mm -hmm. use on a regular basis or else it is a lot of work to think about creating new things and how you market that. You know, Blavity is easy for me to promote because I'm just sharing articles Mm -hmm. that are actually good that I actually think people want to read, right? So that's one of the challenges with skincare for me was like I wasn't always comfortable showing people my bad skin so people couldn't really see. So a lot of people didn't even know I had a skincare line because I wasn't constantly like, look at my face because that doesn't fit my yeah. my brand on Instagram, which is yeah. really about entrepreneurship and showing the behind the scenes of CEO. So Imrose Essentials is going to go through a transformation in the next 18 months because it's just not fitting into my day-to-day routine. Um, and so we we have to go a different go-to-market plan for that lifestyle content. Yeah, I totally resonate with that. And that question was definitely you that answer. Your hair. Yeah, you your separate brand or your hair oh, page. So I was boring. Right? I was that was an that was an experiment. I was thinking of starting a hair based business. And what I realized is, and you can probably relate to this, like sometimes some things just need to be as hobbies. <laughs> What I realized is I don't see myself going back and forth to China and South Korea and all of that. And and I'm comfortable sharing this here because like it's a real consideration that you have to think about as an entrepreneur. Yes, this business, like it's organic to me, it's organic to what I use. However, do I see myself going through what it takes to make it successful and to put that in for, you know, five to six years before I can hand it over to someone else. Are are there times when you've had to make that decision or have that conversation with yourself besides Emerald? Yeah. I mean, I think Emerald is the best example because I was super hype and I love it. I just don't have the capacity Mm -hmm. to do right by it. And even like retailers want Emerald essentials. And I'm like, I cannot be on the phone arguing with y'all about purchase orders right now. That is my priority. So I can't can't allocate working business hours. Um, And if I can't do that, then this isn't the right product for me. So I definitely think you're right in terms of hair. But I would actually challenge you a little bit because Mm -hmm. you could just make one hair product, do one six-month sprint where you do go to South Korea or you do go wherever, buy a block, then put it in a warehouse, then you have to go back. So Mm -hmm. it just depends. Mm -hmm. Depends. But... Like yeah. that's what I did with the notebooks, right? I did one big purchase order and they're sitting yeah. in a warehouse and we're just bending it down. But I don't think about the production, the R and D, like I'm not yeah. sourcing that product anymore. Okay. So see, this is real. this is why I need to work it's smart with Morgan, you guys, because yeah, yeah, like, I, I get overwhelmed easily. I'm like, no, nah, that sounds overwhelming. <laughs> but the way you just phrased it, I'm like, hmm. Because deep down it's still I know it is organic to me. It's something I naturally yes. do. Like I'm always searching for the best hair. Like I'm all about team flawless leave out. However, 
when I think about that aspect of it, that's the part that, you know, overwhelms me. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. And you guys stay tuned to this space. Y'all will see the journey. If, if I do do that, I will bring you along for the ride. <laughs> Good. So now I want to talk a little bit more about the paying it forward piece. Speaking of WorkSmart. <laughs> so what are your plans for the WorkSmart program? How can people become a part of it, learn more, get mentorship from you? I mean, it's really been one of my favorite things um, that's happened pretty organically. You know, people DM me a lot with questions and they're growing their businesses, they're hiring their first employee or they've hired a couple of people, but they're feeling scared because they don't know what to do next and they want to increase their revenue. So many different challenges. And I love just being myself and sharing what I've learned. Um, and I, but I wanted to do that in a scalable way. Like I wanted to do that in a way that was structured so that it could be my method of growing teams and businesses could be duplicated. So the WorkSmart program and just methodology in general, just like most programs, the information is free. It's the work that's the hard part. So it's five milestones, uh, which is manage yourself, learn how to be an effective person of self. You are your biggest employee. You are your biggest driver of growth. Two is manage your team, right? Like you need to master your team. You need to figure out what your org chart looks like. You need to figure out who does what and why, and what's your contingency plans, what's your succession plans. Um, then it's master your data. A lot of entrepreneurs could not tell you what their highest selling product is, where their traffic sources are coming from, um, what content actually drives to sales, not just engagement. Um, what clients are returning, what their average return rate is. It's just all of the data. It's very intimidating for a lot of creators and entrepreneurs who just start off because they're passionate about something and then they're integrating into Google Analytics or Shopify or whatever it may be. So we get into the data and then master your revenue, which is how do you increase your revenue efficiently? How do you make sure your business model is actually set up to scale? A lot of times we have great ideas, the right like tools, the right nuggets, but they've set it up in a way that they're going to constantly burn out. They're, they have limited their business growth by the definition of the type of business model they decided to set up for their business. And if your business is dependent on you showing up every day and you being the one to fulfill your contracts, your clients, your services, then you're never going to make more money than just you because you can't, mm-hmm. because that's, those are the products that you decided to sell. So we really, I really push people to think about the scalability to get to that $500,000 a year level or a million dollars a year or whatever their goal is. And then the last one is just how to test and learn. Like, it's amazing to me for small business and entrepreneurs how much that we can learn by just testing ideas, just like post two things and see which one does better. Like run a Facebook ad just for $500 and see what what your clicks are. You don't have to have had that product yet. So maybe the product that you're thinking about building your hair product, you don't even go to Korea. You just get a photo of it. Okay. (laughs) No, I'm real. I know you you are. I know you are. Run Facebook ads against it and then you get a wait list. And then if you get a threshold above a certain amount, you use that money from the wait list deposit to go finance the product. So I just teach people how to think things through differently and get out of the mental blocker of perfection yes. and like wanting everything to be sh- like in a nice little bucket and a nice yes. little bundle and ready to go. Yep. Um, and so that's the fifth milestone is master your growth. Oh and my we just God. throw that in and that's all we do. And we do examples, we do case studies. I look at their data, they got to start in our homework. I mean, I'm on their asses. Yes. <laughs> and you're, you are, you're on my ass in this interview. <laughs> I'm on your ass now. Listen, I'm thinking about you're right though. The, the, so I've committed publicly to breaking through this this um perfection bubble that has hindered me so much. So coming out of this year, I just know that that is the one thing standing in the way of me testing, starting new things. And so that's why we're here with video. Like it didn't start out perfect and it's not perfect, but it's me pushing past that mental block in my brain. So thank you for that. Did you ever struggle with that or is it just something that you know others struggle with? You know, I think my parents raised me to be fearless. I ask them this all the time. Yeah. Like, what did you guys do to like create this really weird human being? <laughs> um, and they were like really intentional about a lot yeah. of different things, yeah. especially raising a woman, like raising a girl. Um, even up to my name, my name's gender neutral and that was intentional. Mm-hmm. They didn't want people to even before they would even met me to genderize me one mm-hmm. way or the other. Yeah. So yes and no. I do think that I have a sense of 
uh, maybe a bit of narcissistic personality trait where I'm just like, I mean, why not me though? Like, yep, yep, yep. you know, <laughs> like these people over here are doing it. These white boys over here are doing yep. it. I can do it too. I can do um, it too. And I hope that my audacity inspires others to ask themselves, why not me? Why not me? Yep. I love that. And um, I, I've been feeling that a lot lately too. Like when yes. I think about my life and the plans for the future, I'm like, I don't think about like normal people goals or like normal people things. <laughs> and my husband laughs at me all the time because he's like, well, we got to do X, Y, Z because, you know, this is what you want. And I'm like, all right, because that is where I see us going. Right. So I, agree. <laughs> I think about that all the time. Like if, like what made Beyonce or anybody, you know, Kim Kardashian. Why is Kim Kardashian rich? Why is she wealthy? Why, why, why not well, we me? Like, decided to do the things that we didn't, that we didn't, we were not comfortable doing. She invested <laughs> in her body. She invested in her face. She invested in her family. I mean, she took an incredible amount of risk. It was not very popular. People love Kim K now. Everybody hated her. Yeah. And she was naked all the time. Right. People were like, oh, wow. Okay, now people are like, oh my gosh, um, we're still, we still love her. Like, we love her social justice. Look at all our kids. Like, you know, so you got to just be, to, like, literally walk to your own beat. Mm -hmm. And I think anybody who's listening to this is not part of the quote unquote normal. Yeah. You're already investing in yourself. Right. You've already invested your time actively right mm -hmm. now. So, my challenge to all of you all who are listening is like, whatever it is, why not you? Why not you? You know, there's a problem that, that needs to be solved and you complain about it all the time. Why not you? Why not you fix the problem? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, with that, I, I want to transition. Like, I think that's the mic drop. Like, I want to transition into the lightning round because that, that's it right there. So before we go, we're just going to ask you the five quick questions and you answer the first things that come to your mind. Are you ready? Yep. All right. So what is a resource that is helping you the most in your businesses right now that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? I mean, I use Asana all day, every day with all my businesses. So everything from like my team needs me to approve copy for a social media post with a brand deal we're doing on the Devon & Co side to um, like our Afrotech music team tagging me with the updates on the talent that we're booking for headliners. Like it's just my center of tasks for mm -hmm. my team to enable them so that they can get what they need from me without having to call me or text me or DM me on Slack. And number two, who is a black woman entrepreneur that Morgan admires and why? <laughs> oh my God. Like how long of a list can I give you? Uh, um, my girl, Melissa Butler. Oh. I mean, like she just grew her business so well and through a lot of hard work. And I remember meeting her and being like, how big is your team? And she was like, it's three people. I was like, what? <laughs> like you need a hundred people to run what you're running, you know? And I just admire her authenticity and just grit. Um, and she was kind of one of the first people to build a product that was about diversity and beauty and to do it at scale. And um, yeah, I just really admire her. Mm. All right. Number three. What is a non-negotiable part of your day these days? I'd say the first thing that comes to mind is some sort of matcha or coffee. And it's less about the caffeine. I never finish my mm -hmm. cup of coffee or matcha, but it's the routine of like something warm and grounding and just the, the ritual of the coffee. Um, and then the second piece would probably be my standing desk. I mean, that's something that I was kind of like, why do people have standing desks? And then I got <laughs> one and it has changed my energy levels and it's changed my focus. Mm -hmm. And um, when I sit down all day, I can tell the difference in how I feel like physically than yeah. when I alternate between standing and sitting. And then number four, what is a personal habit that has just helped you to be the force that you are? I have, uh, I put a lot of time in and I put a lot of time in regardless of the day. So Saturdays, Sundays, Monday, Tuesdays, holidays, I don't care. Like I will push towards my purpose and my goals. Um, especially in my twenties, I was a very, like I woke up early and I did put my time in before I played. Mm -hmm. Um, and that paid dividends that gave me extra days in the year over everybody else that gave me extra days in the week over everybody else that gave me, 
um, ex- basically, basically got an extra couple years on people when you <laughs> accumulate that time over time. I spend, I work at least eight hours on the weekends. That's a full extra business day. Yeah. I love it. And then finally, what are Morgan's parting words for black women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but are scared to lose that steady paycheck. <laughs> oh, well, I think that you should first focus on replacing your income with your side hustle. You know, I think that's your first goal is address the fear straight on by just focusing on revenue and profit. And too often I see entrepreneurs with side hustles just because they want to be cool and they, they feel yeah. sh- ashamed or embarrassed by their actual day job. And so they want to be able to say, but I actually have this other thing on the side and yeah. cool. That's not going to ever, you're never going to leave your day job then because you're not actually truly passionate about what you're building or the freedom that the income from what you're building will give you. Um, if you are a part of that small group of people who genuinely is ready to replace your income, Focus on the revenue first. Don't try to be sexy. Just get to the bag. I like that. And then finally, let's just remind people where they can connect with you after this episode. Yeah. So first things first, subscribe to the Work Smart Advisor podcast. It's on everywhere that you listen to podcasts. Um, and it's I have downloadables. I do interviews. I share my own personal story, my own wealth stories and advice. Um, so that's the first place. And the second is probably Instagram because I'm on there all day and I respond to DMs and I just share, like, I'm an open book. So, All right. Well, thank you so, so much, Morgan, for being here with us. This was awesome. Thank you for getting my life and putting some, you know, things in my, a bug in my ear of what I need to do next. I'm sure everyone really appreciates this episode. So thank you. And we will talk with you guys. I'll talk to you next week. Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other side hustlers just like you to find the show. And if you want to hear more from me, you can follow me on Instagram at Side Hustle Pro. Plus, sign up for my six foot Saturday newsletter at sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter. When you sign up, you will receive weekly nuggets from me, including what I'm up to, personal lessons, and my business tip of the week week. Again, that's sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter to sign up. Talk to you soon.